Good evening. Tonight, buildings are burning and windows are broken in America. And at this very moment, 99 years ago, the Greenwood neighborhood in Tulsa was about to go up in flames based on a false narrative that Sarah Page had somehow been attacked by Dick Rowland. And that false narrative happened again and again in America. It happened with Emmett Till in the 1950s. It happened with Trayvon Martin. Most recently, Ahmaud Arbery was hunted down because he and Trayvon Martin had their blackness seen as the equivalent of criminal. It happens in Starbucks, coffee shops, in colleges, and in Central Park. And when I say that Amy Cooper was pointing a loaded gun at Christian Cooper when she called the NYPD to report a black man threatening her, look at what has happened to Mr. Floyd and to other black men and women too numerous to name, and then tell me I'm exaggerating. A police officer knelt on George Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes, knowing he was being filmed and with his hand in his pocket to show how casually in control he was. He was backed up by fellow officers in case anybody got the stupid idea of trying to intervene. And if you're asking how this could happen in America in 2020, tonight's program will give you part of the answer. The murder of George Floyd and the Tulsa massacre are stories that are deeply American. They are examples of a history that goes back to the earliest colonial days of America. Does George Floyd remind you of Eric Garner? Shouldn't Breonna Taylor and Tulsa's own Terrence Crutcher be alive today? This is not just about murder by police. Generations of unheard demands for justice are sparking what is happening right now. COVID-19 is stripping away any cover we had to avoid seeing the impact of racism in healthcare, education, the gentrification of neighborhoods, economic and wealth disparities, conditions in communities of color and in black communities in particular that are the direct result of centuries of structural racism. When property is at risk, the mask come off. Listen carefully to leaders from both parties who are using the same rhetoric.
The people who are demonstrating are thugs. When the looting starts, the shooting starts. Vicious dogs, ominous weapons, and the unlimited power of the military is what will protect property. Black America gets your thoughts and prayers. Well, the bleak truth is that the unifying credo for too many in this country, proclaimed from the highest reaches, is one that reserves the full involvement in humankind only to people who look like them. This is both a means to power and an end use of their power. And it's been going on since the first human being was sold as property on this continent. Buildings can be replaced, black lives cannot. Thank you, Rasan and Michael. And we're gonna start tonight's program with libations to our ancestors. In this space, we give homage to those whose blood, whose bones, whose bodies have fertilized the grounds that we stand on. In this sacred land, we pour libation. Those are the Yoruba words that say honor and respect to our ancestors. To our ancestral mothers and fathers. We ask for your permission to begin this journey of telling your story from your voice, from your tongue, from your children. I share. Thank you so much. And I want folks to know as we go through this tour, who we're talking to. Would you introduce yourself? Please? My name is Chief Amoshan, the president of the African Ancestral Society. And Chief, how long have you been here in the place? I've been here all of my life. And why are you involved in the tour that you're about to take? Well, as a descendant, my grand, my ancestor was Raymond Beard Sr. And they left Tulsa during the massacre and never returned until the 40s. Um, I was with them when they were going through the battle to all the way to the Supreme Court to get restoration. And I was with them when they were denied restoration. I was with them when they faced eminent domain from the homes that they lived in. And I felt it was necessary to tell our own story from our own perspective, from our own voice. Um, so that, because I think it's part of the healing process to our own collective trauma. You know, it's not an individual thing. It's a collective trauma that we faced here in Tulsa. So we began honoring these ancestors and honoring those who lived and had that legacy in their, in, in their, ingrained in their memories. And we wanted to find a way to let the community know the world, the global community know that these atrocities happen in these places, right? Because we have to find historic justice as well as other forms of justice. Uh, Napoleon said something. He said, history is a set of lies agreed upon, right? He yes. said, let's, let's, change that, <laughs> let's change that narrative and tell the truth. And so we wanted the truth to be told. And we said, well, we're going to create ideas. We're going to create ways and means to tell the story. And 21 years ago, 22 years ago, we started the Black Wall Street Memorial March, where we would march through the Greenwood community and honor those who, 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 who lived here, who built a legacy here, who died here, who murdered here. We wanted, we wanted their memory to remain. And it's like, it's fitting that there's a poem on this plaque here, on this monument here, written by Winona Murray Bailey. And what the most important part of it, or the, the thing that stands out to me is where she says, few remain to dignify her disgrace or fight to rescind her demise. The ghosts of the better days await. Death rattles to intone the macabre dance. Oh Greenwood, lest you go unheralded, I sing a song of remembrance. While sons of your bounty loyal still place a headstone at the site of your victory. Winona Murray Bailey, right survivor, May of 1967. That's powerful. It says enough to me to say, we're part of the few who remain to dignify her disgrace that they, this, this, we didn't let them get buried alive. And that's what, that's the importance, that's the value, that's the significance of why we do what we do. We've got another person here with us. Absolutely. Who is uh, <laughs> helping us on this tour? And would you introduce yourself? My name is Christy Williams, and I am 
chief's cousin, and I'm also co-chair of the African American, the Greater Tulsa African American Commission with the City of Tulsa. And I will ask you the same question: Why are you here doing this? As Chief said, um, there's an African proverb that says, "Until the lion learns to tell his own story, the story will always be glorified by the hunter." So it's really important that we tell our story as it was given to us. Um, as we continue to fight for justice in this city, we tell those stories um, because everyone has a good story to tell. You get different tours. They have their own value. Um, our value that I love, what we do about our tours is we tell you from the beginning all the way till today. The next spoken word is by Ritten Quincy, poet, teacher from Tulsa. Listen, they call it 
HR formula, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals for us is to address the fundamental injustice, cruelty, brutality, and inhumanity of slavery in the United States and the 13 colonies between 1619 and 1865. I, I feel like it needs to be wrong, but they're they doing something. It's to establish a mission to study and consider a national apology and a proposal for, for, and a proposal for reparations for the institution of slavery. Is subsequent to showing de facto racial and economic discrimination against us, against African American women, to make recommendations to the Congress on appropriate remedies and for the purposes, mean for other purposes, mean. I know. I know. I know. I know. I've been watching sanctions, boycotts. We didn't shut down highways and expressways. I've been taking pictures. I got this camera on my phone, mama. I've been taking videos. They think I'm crazy, mama, because I can hear you breathing. They say, ain't no way she's still alive, Quincy. Ain't no way she's still alive. It's been a hundred years. But her blood is crying. The shovel. I got the shovel with me. Here I come. 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 Reparations. The subject is hot, scalding, and at one time unthinkable by mainstream America as viable public policy. Yet, HR 40 poses only a question. Should reparations be paid for the enslavement era and the atrocities sought by post-enslavement policies and practices, and if so, how? This phenomenal forum answers that question as it shines a light on the Tulsa terrorist race massacre of 1921, the ensuing fight for justice and the quest to pass HR 40, a congressional bill to establish a commission to study the issue of reparations and develop proposals on appropriate remedies. In the context of black people in the United States, Reparations essentially constitutes four elements. Number one, the formal acknowledgement that the enslavement era was a human rights violation accompanied by an official unfettered apology. Number two, recognition that the injury continued through sharecropping, convict leasing, Jim Crow, redlining, a lopsided wealth gap, inherited trauma, and disparate treatment in education health, and the criminal punishment system. Number three, the commitment to redress by culpable parties, including federal, state, and local governments, corporate entities, academic institutions, and religious organizations. And number four, the actual compensation and redress in whatever form or forms are agreed upon. In the words of the National African American Reparations Commission, quote, by educating and mobilizing, organizing to win reparations, we create greater collective awareness of and honor the trials, tribulations, blood, suffering, sacrifice, survival, triumphs, and achievements of our ancestors. Their blood cries out, reparations now.
Thank you, Nkichi. In 2019, the ACLU National Board of Directors overwhelmingly approved the ACLU's official endorsement of HR 40. And the ACLU is a proud partner with national and local organizations for a series of events highlighting the importance of reparations for America's future. We are proud to co-sponsor tonight's events with our Tulsa partners, the African Ancestral Society, Historic Vernon AME Church, Metcares Foundation, the Solomon Simmons Law Firm, the Terrence Crutcher Foundation, the Tulsa Community Remembrance Committee, and from over in Oklahoma City, the ACLU of Oklahoma. Our national co-sponsors are the National African American Reparations Commission and Human Rights Watch, and you will hear from members of both groups tonight. So buckle up, folks. You are about to be compelled to join us on the path to reparations. And with that, I wanna turn the program over to Greg Robinson, an extraordinary man who is an organizer from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Greg? Thank you, Jeff. Before I get started, I really need to shout out my brother, Ridden Quincy, uh, and that performance that he gave. You can find him on all the social media platforms uh, at Ridden Quincy. As for me, uh, I'm the son, I'm the great, great grandson of enslaved Africans. I'm the grandson of a World War II veteran and a small business owner, a nurse, a pastor, and a maid. I'm the son of an activist and an accountant. And I grew up out of the ashes of the Greenwood District here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, known to most as the original Black Wall Street, a place where right now as I speak, citizens have assembled to march through the streets and highways, protesting police brutality and government inaction. And so it is with great humility and a spirit full of the ancestral and gung gung fire that on the 99th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, I welcome you to Tulsa to join our table in our fight to bring justice and peace to the victims of the massacre and their descendants as we make our case for reparations. And let's be clear that the fight for justice here in Tulsa is synonymous with the fight for justice and reparations for African-Americans across the country, represented by House Bill HR 40. Now joining me tonight to root us in the story of Black Wall Street and help make the case for reparations are a few of my personal mentors. They come from and with different perspectives, but all share a long record of service in the fight for freedom and justice for Black people in America, and for the victims of the Tulsa Race Massacre. You'll hear from a son of Tuskegee and my Kappa brother, Reverend Robert Turner, pastor of the historic Vernon AME Church. From a woman cut from the cloth of Shirley Chisholm herself, District One City Councilor in the city of Tulsa, Councilwoman Vanessa Hall Harper. From Tulsa's preeminent civil rights attorney, Law is his ministry, but justice is his passion. Attorney DeMario Solomon Simmons of Solomon Simmons Law. And a true daughter of Black Wall Street, representative of Oklahoma's 73rd Legislative District, State Representative Regina Goodwin. But we start with the little woman with the booming voice, Tulsa's own Fannie Lou Hamer, the activist and the author and historian, Ms. Christy Williams. Ms. Christy, when I met you, you were talking Greenwood. And today, you're still talking Greenwood. So as a child from Philadelphia, why has the story of Greenwood resonated with you so much? You know, um, I always say that Greenwood knew me before I knew Greenwood and Oklahoma knew me before 
I knew Oklahoma. My mother is from Owasso, Oklahoma, and I have deep family ties here in Oklahoma. My Aunt Janie Edwards, uh, my great Aunt Janie Edwards was in the Dreamland Theater when the massacre happened. Um, she was on a date, was not supposed to be on the date, but uh, she was there when it happened and escaped with her life and she ran to Owasso. Um, and my, my great grandfather, Jesse Franklin, was the first African Creek to serve on the, the Creek Nation Supreme Court. So tell us how all this got started. How did the 40 square blocks uh, in Tulsa there become Black Wall Street? You know, um, besides Africa, Oklahoma really is the epicenter of Black history. And I say that because Oklahoma, before it was a state, was Indian territory. And the only people who could own land in Oklahoma was Indians and Black people. A lot of people don't know that. But um, as you, we hear the stories of our history classes in school about the five civilized tribes, they don't tell you that they had slaves. Indians had slaves, and those slaves were on the Trail of Tears with Indians during the Trail of Tears. Um, this map that you see here, um, all the five civilized tribes, they had slaves in 1866. 1866 was the peace treaty. And in that peace treaty, those five civilized tribes gave citizenship to the slaves that they had. And with the citizenship, you were awarded 166 acres of land. So all the blue that you see on this map are Creek citizens, which we call freedmen. When they became citizens, they were called freedmen. Look at all that land that they owned in Oklahoma, which is why in 1920, we had over 50 black townships in Oklahoma. And the little square at the top, the little yellow square is Tulsa. Is Tulsa. So if you look at that, look at all that land, that's 1,192,240 acres of land that black people owned. And a lot of that land had oil wells. So just imagine the money that came from that. Thank you, Christy. I'm gonna turn to Representative Regina Goodwin. Regina, they say a lot is in a name and your family name will obviously be forever linked to Greenwood and Black Wall Street. Um, can you talk us through that connection do you feel an added responsibility to seek justice because of your family's connection? Greg, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> I was gonna say absolutely. Uh, the fact that uh, my family um, has deep roots here in Tulsa, certainly in the Greenwood area. Uh, of course I have that, that responsibility, but whether there's a name attachment or not, uh, we all have that responsibility if we really care uh, about growth and we care about the lives that were lost and taken and murdered uh, on Greenwood. So I would say this, just as it relates uh, to the family, uh, they came from Water Valley, Mississippi, coming knowing that they could get a better education here. Uh, so they were trying to flee oppression for a better opportunity, uh, did come and uh, of course with O.W. Gurley and a number of other folks, McCabe, the call was come to Oklahoma. And at that time, as Christy had said, it was Indian territory. And then in 1907, certainly there was statehood, but there was opportunity here. And, and black folks were very independent and very productive. Uh, my family, certainly my uh, James Henry Goodwin was my great grandfather. Um, Carly Marie Goodwin 
Then there is my grandfather, Ed Goodwin, and my grandmother, Jean Goodwin, and I am um, descendant of race massacre survivors. So absolutely, we carry that, and we grew up knowing the story and knowing that uh, we have to lengthen that legacy in terms of what we do and how we do. So this is obviously the 99th anniversary, and I'm sure you've been told and have told the story many times. Um, but for the folks listening in who may be new uh, or needing a refresher, can you take us through what happened uh, on the days of uh, May 31st and June 1st, 1920? Again, and again, uh, against that backdrop, then the, the heavy racism that was there, um, you're looking at in Oklahoma, the first Senate Bill 1 was a racist bill that seg segregated Black folks from white folks. In that backdrop, you've got Greenwood, you've got a thriving area, you've got folks that have uh, homes, beautiful homes, you have industry, you have theaters, and you have Black folks that owned their own own airplanes and flew their own planes. Uh, you certainly had the savings alone. You had uh, hospitals. Um, so against this backdrop, you have um, black folks that are, are doing well and white folks, quite frankly, that uh, refer to the area as little Africa as if that was somehow insulting. We took that as something very beloved because we know where all humanity begins. So. Against that backdrop, it was a matter of, of race and folks trying to be told to stay in their place. And there was Dick Rowland, who was a teenager, a shoe shiner. And he would often go over to the Drexel building every day. And uh, this was just another day for him. And he went to that building uh, and there was Sarah Page, a 17 year old woman, a uh, young lady, she was the elevator operator. And uh, the story goes uh, from what we're told as, is that he stumbled onto her and their contact was made. Uh, she hollers out uh, the story, uh, he runs away. The story becomes that as it read in the Tribune that there was an attempted attack, all right? Long story short, um, he, he runs. There's an article in the Tribune that says uh, elevator nabbed, uh, uh, Negro nabbed an elevator. Uh, and, and then there's an uproar as if there was an attempted attack. Now watch that, it says attempted attack that Sarah Page supposedly claimed with Dick Rowland. Uh, of course, at that time, World War I veterans, black men who had defended their country were certainly going to defend this black man because lynchings were common and they'd gone down to the courthouse. You had Mr. Smitherman of Tulsa Star who was meeting and, and plotting how we save our own and uh, Mr. J.B. Stratford um, at that time, we had the largest hotel in America, 55 rooms. So you had folks that uh, were going to take care of their own in terms of our own humanity, went down. Uh, uh, and then they found out that uh, these World War I veterans went down armed. And there were maybe about 10 black men that went down to the courthouse at that time. And a uh, white man said, what are you gonna do with that gun? Black man says, I'm gonna use it if I have to. And uh, from that, there was a struggle over the gun. The gun goes off. Uh, the first casualty was an uh, oil exec named Mr. Dag, and uh, you had, from that point, someone said all hell broke loose, and uh, from that, the area that was known across the nation as uh, being pivotal in terms of industry, uh, showing hardworking families and showing a state that was almost the first black state in America, it had become uh, this place that was going to be destroyed by racist terrorists, white mobs that were going to run through some 36 blocks and tear down what humanity had, had built. Um, uh, from that, Greg, you saw uh, literally the Dreamland Theater destroyed. You saw um, uh, the hospitals and, and, and the hotels absolutely destroyed. More importantly, some 300 black folks were murdered, murdered. And uh, till this day, we still have not had reparation, reparations. We've not had reclamations. We've not had uh, any, any real justice as it comes to how these souls would be um, somehow cared for. And uh, so that is, the, that is in short what happened in terms of, of, of Greenwood. And 
does the story of Dick Rowland, the story of, of Greenwood, the massacre, um, from your perspective, does it still have relevance uh, today? Does it have relevance to the events happening right now outside of Tulsa? Well, absolutely. First, you had Sarah Page, who was a white woman who had falsely accused the black man, Dick Rowland. Uh, that certainly uh, is equivalent to Carolyn Bryant, who falsely accused Emmett Till, right? And, and that atrocious murder that everyone remembers. And that was a seminal moment in history. And now you've got Miss Amy Cooper, who accused Christian Cooper. Uh, he's a black man in New York, bird watching. And the same thing, he was using simply that an African-American was, she says, uh, assaulting her and, and threatening her, and none of that was true. So yes, absolutely. The narrative from 1921, 1955, 2020, it's the same. Uh, somehow these, these lies uh, um, are ending lives. Now, this movement for reparations uh, for the victims of the race massacre is certainly not the first push. Uh, you were around when uh, the first race massacre commission uh, got started. Um, what can you tell us as we go through this tonight? Uh, what came uh, from that previous movement uh, for reparations? So, so what you, you know, as we had some in, in 2003, where the, the suit was begun, you had Charles Ogletree, some of the most brilliant minds in America. And we had Johnny Cochran and Dennis Sweet and Rose Ture, Jim Goodwin was on that team along with a number of other attorneys. And the effort was at that time, some 200 uh, race massacre survivors were still alive. And, um, and it was about getting justice for these folks. And what you found was uh, a number of folks, you had, uh, individually 500 different claims, insurance claims that went, uh, that were denied. Uh, my, great -grand my great grandmother was one of those folks that had the nerve to go down to the courthouse yeah. and say, guess what? We need reparations, we need restoration. Uh, what happens is they're denied in Tulsa, Oklahoma and we go to the US District Court. Uh, then you go to um, uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, you went to the 10th District, I'm sorry, 10th District. Then you went on to the Supreme Court and all denials, and Charles Ogletree, even at that time, tried an international tribunal. He did everything he knew to do to get justice for these folks. Uh, what became of that was Don Ross, Representative Ross and Senator Maxine Horner uh, did a study. Uh, out of that study, it said that uh, reparations are due. Uh, they even talked about uh, the park that we do see now. Uh, that did come out of that effort. Uh, there are some scholarships, a few scholarships that were meted out in, in that day, but not, not a lot. So there was some effort, but by and large, some $2.8 million that, we, that were recorded in uh, the parish book, uh, that's back in 1921 dollars. So calculate that in 2020 time, plus some, and you can get what we probably are way overdue when it comes to reparations and a community being restored and the people being restored. And it's nothing um, short of when you look at Greenwood today, uh, you can see that there's gentrification happening. Uh, we've not uh, recovered. We are, um, um, there have been takeover attempts. Uh, there have been businesses that come up uh, that are not uh, reflective of the, the industry and, and the dreams of black folks that lived here and own land. So that is the battle now that if we're going to have a green wood, it can't be gone wood. It's got to be something that's got to be restored, but it's got to be restored for black owned businesses. Absolutely. Thank you uh, for sharing uh, Representative Goodwin. I know uh, that this time is, is always a tough one for you, uh, especially because the battle is not, is not won yet. Um, I'm gonna turn to another warrior. Uh, attorney DeMario Solomon Simmons. Uh, and before I introduce him, I'm actually going to let Senator Maxine Waters uh, introduce him. DeMario Solomon Simmons, you are everything we tell our young people we want them to be. You've done what we've asked you to do. First of all, you went to school and you got educated. You did what your parents told you to do. And having been educated, you decided that you were gonna help educate others in a formal way and an informal way. And you decided that you were going to take an issue 
that had been excluded from our history books and issues that had not been talked about for 75 years. And you were going to do something about it and something you have done. I appreciate your leadership. I thank you for showing other young people what they ought to be doing. I thank you for not simply being a puppy who's looking for a dollar, who's simply looking for the trip to the mountains to ski, who's not simply looking for all that you certainly could afford, but for someone who's taken your talent, your education, to bring about justice and equality for our people. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you. Mario Solomon Simmons. Demario, we both grew up here in the shadow of Greenwood. I like to sometimes imagine what it could have been like growing up uh, in that time in 1921. Uh, could you take us through uh, what it what it would have felt like uh, for for two boys like us growing up in 1921? Well, you know, Greg, as a son of Oak Black Oklahoma, my family's been here since the 1830s. As Chrissy talked about coming across the Trail of Tears, my ancestors actually signed a treaty of 1866 for the Creek Nation. So I can just imagine being in Greenwood at that time, being able to have so much pride and just wonderful people walking around, being strong, being free, being able to control their own destiny. It would have been something that would just continue to give you great pride. And think about the, the organization or the generational wealth that would have been created now 100 years later. It's an amazing thought. And it's one of the reasons why I fight so hard for our people, fight for justice for Greenwood. It is not just about fighting justice for the lives that were lost, the property that was looted, the homes that was burnt, the people that were exiled forever to never return to Oklahoma, to return to Tulsa. But we're talking about an entire movement and a mentality for the entire black nation of this United States of America. That's what Greenwood represents. And that's why we must continue to fight for Greenwood and fight for justice. I really like what Regina had to say about, we wanna make sure that Greenwood justice comes to those who created Greenwood. And that was the black people of Greenwood. They built Greenwood. They made Greenwood great. They suffered the damage and they should reap the reparations. And for those who may not really just understand the scope of the damage, uh, take us through uh, the scope of the devastation. Absolutely. You know, I spent countless hours with many of our uh, victims, survivors at the time, people like Otis Clark, who was our oldest survivor. He died at 111. Olivia Hooker, you saw in the video from the beginning, SD Hooker, that was her father's shop. You're talking about Wes Young. You know, I, I, I traveled to DC with these folks on multiple occasions when Regina talked about going to the court, Supreme Court going to Congress, going to the International Court of Appeals, okay, International Court. I spent time with them and they talked about what they lost. They talked about how it felt for years later to maybe go in someone's home as a repair person and you see your grandmother's uh, property there, but that was just looted. So we're talking about a real psychological damage. Now when you start talking about numbers, we're looking at between 50 and $100 million just in property damage wow. alone. Let me say that again, 50 to $100 million just in property damage. But how much is a life worth, Greg? How much is a life worth? They say conservatively, or maybe around 300 people were killed. How much is a life worth? I mean, just today, uh, another group here in Tulsa talked about Dr. A.C. Jackson. And they talked about a Dr. A.C. Jackson, who was a man who was considered the finest African-American surgeon in the world. He's someone who had created medical devices that are still being used today. He created almost 100 years ago. This man who was working tirelessly trying to care for his citizens, his brothers and sisters in Greenwood that were coming to the hospital after being injured by the white, ma uh, white mob. At three, about three o'clock in the morning as he's walking home, he, has, he gets confronted by a white mob. He puts his hands up in the air and he's shot in the stomach. And he bleeds out while he's laid over into the internment camp for six hours. Now this is a tremendous doctor and he bleeds to death. 
for six hours. How much is his life worth, Greg? The number we're talking about is in the billions. And then you talk about the continual massacre since 1921 when they tried to stop Greenwood from rebuilding. Some people were able to rebuild, but a lot of people couldn't. Mm. When we start talking about rebuilding, we're not talking about a few businesses on along Greenwood Avenue Street. This was over four square miles. This was a town basically wow. that was destroyed. The thirties and the forties, the city of Tulsa, many homes didn't even have running water or piping because the city of Tulsa neglected them so much because they said they never wanted to see quote unquote nigga town rise again. Mm. We're talking about going into the 50s and the 60s where the city of Tulsa decided they were going to run the highway through the black community with urban, urban renewal and destroy them further. And that's exactly what they did. They uprooted thousands of blacks, took their property, sent them further north and ran that highway through. And now the shame and the sham of Tulsa, the same people who destroyed Greenwood, the same people who oppress black people in this city every single day are now trying to capitalize off the story of Greenwood. Hmm. They don't want to talk about reparations like we're talking about tonight. They don't hmm. want to talk about redress. They want to talk about healing and reconciliation. Hmm. Well, as Sister Nik Nik Nikichi said earlier, you cannot have reconciliation without rep reparations, period. Hmm. Demario, I'm trying to stay in the seat now. Uh, when, you know, when I walked into your law office, when you allowed me to come and be a mentee of yours, there was a picture that you have behind you, a picture of, of Charles Ogletree and of, of John Hope Franklin. Uh, and you told me the story of how, uh, as a young attorney, you got to fight alongside them uh, for reparations for the victims of the massacre. Um, and you told me that you lost. I want you to tell that story to the people. How did it feel to fight and lose that battle? You know, with everything that's going on in this nation right now, thinking about the pain, not for me, Greg, but for our clients and the survivors to say, what is it? They know who did it. They know the city of Tulsa did this. Hmm. They know I suffered. Here I am alive, but you won't pay me. Mm. You won't you won't hold anybody criminally liable. See, this is a badge of slavery that we're actually fighting against. And the badge of slavery, uh, the 13th Amendment prohibits a badge of slavery. What is a badge of slavery? A badge of slavery is any legal disability that prevents one who's enslaved or formerly enslaved from asserting a certain legal right. Mm. A legal right, for, for example, to be paid what you're owed the legal right to be able to hold your assailant accountable in court. That is what's being stripped from us since 1921 to today. To this day, we are still being withheld the right to hold those who destroyed us and are destroying us as we speak accountable. And that's why it's hurt so bad as Otis Clark died, as Olivia Hooker died, as Wes Young died, and now our oldest known living survivor, Mother Randall, who's 105 years old, who says, how come they will not do the right thing? Mm -hmm. It's because we're still facing and fighting the anti-black white supremacy that burnt down Greenwood, that shot Terrence Crutch with his hands up and choked out George, brother George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And then, you know what? These people hold on to this with a religious zealousy. And we must have the same type of zealousy as we fight against it. As those brothers could go down to the courthouse in 1921 and say, you're not going to lynch Dick Rowland. Well, God damn it, I certainly can stand up and fight for everybody that's made it possible for me to be here today. Is there still a legal claim to be made for reparations? I think there's a legal claim to be made. There is a moral claim to be made. But I think the interesting thing, and I see you have this document on the screen. This is the official document from our lawsuit, from the lawsuit back in uh, the early 2000s. And I think this is really important. If you, I don't know if they have page seven, but on page seven of this document, the city of Tulsa says we have, we do not, we're not responsible at all for any of the damage that's mm -hmm. done. So if that's your official, that's your official way that you're looking at this city of Tulsa, that's your official response, that you're not responsible for any damage, then why are you trying to capitalize 
1921? Why are you trying to say that you are want to move forward when you won't even accept that you are the one that's responsible for the damage, the mayhem, and the destruction that Black people have experienced since 1921 to this very moment? Demario, brother, I appreciate you. Keep hey, up I, I appreciate you. I'm attorney Demario Solomon Simmons. Law is my ministry. Justice is my passion. Anybody wants to get into this fight with all of us, please, please reach out. You have that YouTube. You can hit me up at Attorney Demario. I'm appreciative of you, Greg, and everybody that's on this because we must march forward this hundred year. This is a dual die scenario. Reparations now, reparations now, reparations now. Yes, sir. I'm going to turn to another passionate leader, uh, Councilwoman Vanessa Hall Harper. Ms. Vanessa, tell us when did you really learn the story of Greenwood? I know you grew up here, but when did you learn the story of Greenwood and, and what did it mean to you then? What does it mean to you now? Uh, good evening, Greg. Um, the story of Greenwood uh, first meant something to me uh, when I first heard it. Um, and sadly, I was an adult. Uh, even though I was born and raised in North Tulsa, uh, even though uh, I attended Tulsa Public Schools, um, the history of Greenwood Black Wall Street uh, was not taught in public schools. And it was taboo to speak of to a very large degree. My grandmother was born in February of 1921. And so she grew up in the aftermath uh, of the massacre. And when I went to talk to her, her about it after I heard of it, um, she still was apprehensive about talking about it. And when I asked her about that and why, uh, she said, we just didn't talk about it. We just didn't talk about it. And so how I felt, I felt proud of what my ancestors was, were able to, to accomplish uh, with Black Wall Street. But more than that, it angered me. And, and I'm still angry, to be perfectly honest with you. I'm pissed off uh, about the, the loss of life uh, and the loss of property uh, that took place and justice has never been received. Uh, and that is what drives me today to fight for reparations. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by that, that anger. Um, I certainly see it in you every day. And, and you've used your positional power uh, really to be a tireless advocate, uh, not only for justice, for race massacre victims, but for the revitalization of, of Greenwood and, and Black Wall Street. Um, tell us what's happening now in the city of Tulsa uh, around those two issues. Okay. Well, uh, first I wanna acknowledge some of our ancestors um, that have fought for years to honor uh, Black Wall Street, uh, uh, such as the African Ancestral Society as an organization. You got Representative Don Ross who fought tirelessly um, as well as Senator Maxine Horner and others. But up to this point, uh, any efforts or progress that have been made to honor our ancestors and the legacy of Black Wall Street have been community driven or grassroots driven. Our local government uh, has failed. The local governmental power structure has failed. And so some of the things that we have done uh, at the grassroots level, the creation of the Black Wall Street Chamber of Commerce, whose mission is to uh, be serious and unapologetic about raising up and supporting Black businesses and Black entrepreneurship. Uh, the Black Wall Street Chamber of Commerce also have created the Power Group, uh, which is the, the first African-American grassroots economic development uh, fund for North Tulsa in the Black community. Uh, through the leadership of Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, as well as Dr. Robert Turner, uh, the Tulsa Community Remembrance Coalition was established uh, to create the Black Wall Street Memorial Project, which is underway, uh, which includes the Community Remembrance Project and the soil collections. We were blessed to participate in a soil collection today uh, mm -hmm. that recognized the sites where victims were lynched. Uh, all of these initiatives are community grassroots projects. Uh, historically, the government, as I've said, both city and state has failed to acknowledge and honor uh, those Tulsa citizens, because they were citizens who were massacred in 1921. But today, soon after a national article in the Washington Post was published in September of 2018, and it was entitled, They Was Killing Black People, the city of Tulsa announced that an investigation concerning the mass graves would be reopened. And that investigation 
is currently underway, which includes a community oversight committee uh, to ensure transparency. In addition, the city of Tulsa has recently announced uh, the creation of destination districts, uh, one of which is the historic Greenwood District Main Street Program. And, and the mission is to, to preserve the historic character of Greenwood. Uh, a 1921 race massacre mission uh, has also been created and that's made up mostly of Tulsa's power elite and local philanthropic and corporate dollars. Uh, co corporate dollars are being raised to build a history center uh, as quick as possible before May of 2021. Uh, so that there are efforts underway, some of which are authentic, I believe, and then some of which are for show, but we do have some efforts as we approach the centennial next year. So to a casual listener, I mean, that sounds like a lot, uh, Councilwoman Harper, I mean, why isn't that enough? Why, why push for reparations at this point? Well, Greg, reparations are inextricably linked to justice. We cannot talk about reparations uh, without talking about justice. And so until there is an active, permanent, and perpetual plan for reparations in the city and state uh, as a result of the 1921 massacre, as well as reparations for the institution of slavery in this country, justice will not be satisfied. Uh, we must understand that the massacre of 1921 in Tulsa, Oklahoma is an extension of the institution of slavery in this country. Hmm. Uh, it is the same narrative. It is the experience of the African in America. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is in this country, black lives are not valued. And that is why the city of Tulsa and the state of Oklahoma and the United States of America for that matter has refused any form of reparations for Africans in America. So why now, you ask, from the local governmental and power structure uh, perspective, the initiatives that I mentioned earlier have, have I believe, uh, only reason why these efforts are taking place is because we are approaching the centennial. We are approaching mm -hmm. the 100 year. Uh, we, Tulsa will be on the worldwide stage. Uh, and so we, some of us in this community, uh, are concerned about that image. Uh, the community has been crying out for these things for, for decades, decades and decades. Uh, but now all of a sudden, why? And we have to, we have to pay attention to that, why? Uh, but as the centennial approaches, Tulsa will be on the worldwide stage again. And the penetrating question is going to be, what has changed? Mm. Uh, the city of Tulsa, state of Oklahoma, doesn't want to appear again on the worldwide stage uh, as the racist ass city that it is. That's what we're boiling <laughs> down to. Uh, so we have a history center that's being built, thrown up real quick as we possibly can. Uh, we have grant monies from the National Park Service. We're proud of that. Mass graves uh, investigation, all in a rush, all in a rush to give this appearance that there is justice here. Uh, but from the, com the Black community's perspective, why now? Uh, because the Centennial Commemoration offers a black this Black community an opportunity that we have not had before, uh, at least to this degree, and that is to be heard. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, can't be, you, you can best believe we're going to take advantage of that. Um, and so we are looking for things, not Band-Aids, uh, not things, uh, uh, temporary Band-Aids where we can stand around and sing Kumbaya and say, oh, this is one Tulsa, this is one Tulsa. No, it's not. Uh, it's not even close. Uh, but rather, we will use this opportunity to obtain an active, permanent, and perpetual plan for reparations uh, that will result in generational wealth and self-sufficiency that was robbed from us, that was robbed from us 250 years ago in slavery that was robbed from us 100 years uh, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and that is still being robbed today from me and my community. And so that's what we're about. Councilwoman, uh, I appreciate your fight. Uh, as you said, power concedes nothing without well, struggle. And so continue to struggle. Uh, we appreciate you. Um, I'm gonna turn to yet another freedom fighter. Uh, actually, fresh off of the streets uh, this weekend and, and just a few minutes ago, uh, Reverend Robert Turner uh, of the historic Vernon AME Church. Reverend Turner, uh, how did you come to be the pastor of Vernon AME Church? First of all, good evening and thank you all for having me. I um, came to be the pastor using church vernacular by being assigned to Vernon. Uh, by a bishop, that's the technical sense, but the spiritual sense is I was uh, going through a spiritual transition in my life where I felt God was calling me to do greater service, and 
I uh, one night was praying um, as I typically do when I feel that unction um, because I, I I normally fight those moments. Um, and this night I um, I said, Lord, I don't know what it is you want me to do, but I know that it's it's something. Um, and and this time I I won't fight you. I will just say yes. And um, I got off my knees. I prayed. I, and I finished my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I got off my knees and I reached for my cell phone and I um, was about to put on the charger. And before I put it on the charger, I um, I looked at how much juice I had and uh, I saw I had a text message. And the text message was from the bishop of this region, uh, Bishop Michael E.M. Mitchell. And he sent me a text message saying, I have an opportunity for you, brother. Would you be willing to accept? And it just uh, blew my mind. Like two seconds early, I had just said yes to God. Whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, I say yes. And two seconds later, I get the question to something I've already, I'd already told God I would do. And so I just replied back, yes. And um, I, I just laid back on my bed. And I gave out a deep sigh of frustration, relief, or whatever. And my wife could sense something and obviously saw me responding to a text message at around 11.30 at night. So that had its own set of issues, potentially. <laughs> and she said, um, is everything all right? And I was like, yeah, I, I know cold language. That's who is that texting you at 11 something at night? Oh, you responded to it at 11 something at night. And so me being a, a, a wise husband, I, in my early years of marriage, I would just went to sleep but you know you pick up things as you yeah. stick with somebody for a long time and uh i said that was the bishop and i asked me if i could come to his district and uh i said yes and she said what to, to preach i was like uh no to pastor and so and she said what did you say i said i said yes and uh the, the that five seconds that she paused the longest five seconds i had in my marriage uh, and I'm thinking she's about to say, well, you didn't consult me, you didn't talk to me. And we had a really nice life. We were, I was managing a $3 million grant in Alabama to fight racism in Selma and pastoring the church and um, all of that wonderful stuff. And I, I told her, I said, yes. And she said, wow, well, I guess we're going. And so we came and I've been here. I didn't know what church I was going to. I didn't know how much money I was gonna be making. I didn't know what school my boys were going to. I didn't know where we were gonna live, but I knew God was in it. I knew. I knew then in 2017 that God had a reason for me coming. And I didn't know what that was until I got here. And so, so let's talk about that a little bit, uh, because certainly you have started to really embody uh, the, the spirit of Greenwood and Black Wall Street. And um, I've just always been curious uh, why you took to that so rapidly. Why did that resonate with you so much? Greenwood really, to be honest, remind me, reminds me a lot of Tuskegee. You know, that's why I was born and raised. Uh, Tuskegee, a town of about 10, 12,000 people, wonderful history, very, uh, a culture of excellence um, that everybody expects you to just excel. Uh, and Greenwood is the same way, culture of excellence where people expect you to excel and folks speak up for themselves. Um, yeah. and, and, and has suffered a lot of trauma. Tuskegee suffered from the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, where the government gave syphilis to black men for 40 years from 1932 to 1972 in Tulsa, Greenwood, suffering from the worst race massacre uh, in American history. And, and I think also, you know, the fact that Booker T. Washington from Tuskegee uh, gave the name uh, Negro Black Wall Street. And, yeah. and the fact the very early inhabitants of of Tulsa were Native Americans that came from the Lochapolka or Tallahassee area, which is like 10 minutes from my front door in Tuskegee. So it Tulsa, believe it or not, felt like home. So you often speak of a couple elements um, at Vernon, uh, the, the basement uh, and the sign um, outside the front. Um, what do those things symbolize uh, to you uh, in terms of uh, our African-American experience here? Well, the basement to me um, truly symbolizes just black people. Um, the fact that our basement is the only structure intact on Greenwood that survived uh, the race massacre from 1921, um, that 
and it still serves as the foundation for our sanctuary that was built uh, shortly after the massacre in 1925. Um, this Vernon has been a presence here on Greenwood since 1908. You know, that's the first, the cornerstone you see is the cornerstone from our first structure. Um, and our basement really symbolizes that perseverant spirit uh, of black people. Uh, that regardless of what you do to us, I mean, you could, you could, you could exploit us, you can oppress us, but we still find a way to survive, and not just survive, but to be built on, and that's what the basement symbolizes. And yeah. the light outside, I remember hearing recently, uh, a few moments ago, from Attorney Solomon Simmons about how the city of Tulsa refused to put any utilities in the black area, um, black side of town, North Tulsa, Greenwood, um, and that's so true. Um, and the reason why we have that sign is because the city refused to put street lights up in the black neighborhood. Uh, and so black women would walk home from work in the dark, black men would walk in the dark. And so uh, likely for them to be uh, accosted. Um, and the members of Vernon said, we're not going to wait for the city to put street lights up. Yeah. We're going to put our own street lights up. And that's what the marquee light is. It, it's, it was put in place in 1949 and it's been in that same spot ever since. Now, Pastor, you you like signs. Uh, you you keep a sign on you. I think you got a sign behind you. It's very clear. It says reparations now. Uh, you also hold that sign up every week at City Hall. Uh, why do you go so hard, so consistently uh, for reparations? Make your case. I've been a supporter of reparations and an advocate for reparations as soon as I was able to remember being taught about it in my high school, uh, slavery and the effects of it and the fact that there was never and has never been any type of compensation to the slaves that were owned by governmental agencies, by churches, by schools, by individual citizens. Um, and coming to Tulsa, finding out about the race massacre. And I knew about Black Wall Street, but finding out that nothing had been done to rectify that terrible tragedy, mm. it just really uh, gave me motivation and, and talking to God about it and, and having and, and instructing me to go down to City Hall um, to tell his people, to tell the world, to tell the city especially um, that God is still watching. Um, and God demands reparations, uh, you know, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year, but now, you know, because we have waited too long yes. and the time is now. The time is now. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Thank you for what you continue to do. Uh, and the time is now, brother. I appreciate you greatly. Um, I'm going to go back to, to Miss Christie. Uh, Ms. Christie, you have, uh, have listened tonight uh, and, and consistently, uh, you know, you walk and tour and teach uh, the, 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 on the streets of Greenwood, on the streets of, of Black Wall Street uh, and, and the place uh, where the massacre took, took place. Um, what do you find yourself reflecting on the most uh, during those times? You know, um, what I reflect the most on is, of course, the massacre of what happened, um, the killings, the destroying of property. Um, but what I what I think about is those people who were able to come back to Greenwood, who never those who never left, those who lived in tents, and the rebuilding. How I, I just think about how did they rebuild? How how was it? that they had the courage to stay here and rebuild. And I think about that often because, you know, people don't realize Greenwood was rebuilt in 1926 um, and better, better than before. Mm. Um, it also had 25 grocery stores, architects, doctors. This is in uh, 1920, you know, not right, right after the massacre. That's amazing. You know, our ancestors created an economy within an, with, within an economy, not once, but twice. And they did it without reparations. So 
when I think about that and I hear our ancestors crying out to us now, how dare we not follow the, bl the blueprint that they left for us? And so when you talk about that blueprint, uh, why, why must reparations be a part of it today? Because they owe it to us. Reparations has been due for us for a very long time. We need shared resources. We need shared power. We need what was taken from us. And reparations is due. It's, it's been long overdue. And imagine what we did without reparations and what we can do with reparations. You know, um, we talk about healing as a people. And I believe that's important. But I also believe we're not even going to get there until we get what is owed to us. There it is. Thank you, Miss Christie. Um, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I, I just appreciate you all on a, on a human level uh, for giving uh, a son of Greenwood, like myself, uh, the spirit and the hope and the faith to continue to fight. Um, I'm now actually going to turn uh, and take us back uh, to 2016, September 16th. Uh, when Tulsa Police Officer Betty Shelby uh, killed Terrence Crutcher in cold blood. Uh, his hands up. He said, don't shoot. He was unaggressive and he was unarmed. But more than that, Terrence was a father. He was a college student. And he was a twin brother to our beloved Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. That day, Terrence was on his way to a music workshop at the church where his mother and father were waiting on. He was Tulsa's native son and he should still be alive today. A month after Terrence was killed, Human Rights Watch came to Tulsa bearing witness to how black people have been treated here for decades even after the race massacre. They raise the curtain on a police force that often operates like black lives truly don't matter. I believe we're in a state of emergency. 40 year old Terrence Crutcher was killed on Friday when local officers responded to a call of a stalled vehicle in the middle of the road. The killing of Terrence Crutcher like many of the other high profile police killings throughout the US in recent years, has really helped to expose some of the often discriminatory and even brutal tactics by police. When you have unarmed individuals that you've pulled over because of a routine traffic stop or because you don't like the way they talk to you and then you get them out of the car and you bring all of these police officers and helicopters for what? Human Rights Watch defends the rights of people in 90 countries around the world, spotlighting abuses and bringing perpetrators to justice. They have stood up for Tulsa's black community and they have stood with us. We're grateful to not be in this fight alone. With that, I'm pleased to introduce the executive director of the US program at the Human Rights Watch, Ms. Nicole Austin Hillary. Thank you so much, Greg. You know, if we did not know it before tonight and before this week, it is now crystal clear that what happened to Terrence Crutcher and the root causes of what led to his untimely death are not just about Tulsa, but it's about America. The death of Terrence Crutcher and the death this past Monday of George Floyd did not just happen by coincidence or by circumstance. Abuse by police in Tulsa did not just happen. Tulsa, like many cities and towns in America, prioritized policing over protecting, simply put. The casualty of those kinds of decisions was and are black lives. 
The death of Terrence Crutcher and this history of abuse is what brought Human Rights Watch to Tulsa. When we heard about the death of Terrence Crutcher, we said, what is going on in this place? We have to be there and we have to find out the truth. When our senior researcher whom you just saw on that video clip, John Rafling, and our quantitative analyst, Brian Root, finished their research in Tulsa, they made some significant findings. First, they found out that Tulsa devotes much of its budget to policing, not to the community, but to policing. Policing has accounted for one third of the outlays from the general fund, which is the city of Tulsa's primary operating fund over the past five years. By contrast, their funding for things like public works and transportation, you know, those kinds of things that make a community safer and more livable for working people, made up only about 10% of their budget in fiscal year 2018 and 2019. And the social and economic development fund, that category under which such things as reparative justice might fall, that made up only about 4% of the budget. This is simply the kind of decision-making that leaves Tulsa and other communities in a state of disrepair in terms of how they support their Black community. A failure to recognize the vestiges of slavery and racism that manifested themselves in the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre and beyond is the reason we live in a Tulsa and in a nation with severe economic, social, and racial disparities. In Minneapolis, we also see a failure to respect and address what history has taught us. Back in 1967, we saw what was then called the Red Summer, when tensions boiled over given a lack of economic opportunity, restrictions on housing, and other failures of government. Today in Minneapolis, they haven't learned. Police violence is at the center of what happened to George Floyd, along with intense conditions of inequality. This is the kind of decision-making and the kind of bad acting that created a dual Minneapolis in which Black lives were and are undervalued by authorities. Human Rights Watch and our research has helped to shine a light on these disparities in Tulsa and working with the committed community leaders in Tulsa whom you've already heard from tonight. Through our research, we recommend a way forward. More importantly, International human rights law sets the path for a way forward. That's where we come in. That's what supports and allows us to stand now in favor of reparations. Now the approach to reparative justice has to be twofold. It has to focus on changes at both the local and national levels. And that's what our research has told us. First, the United States is a party to the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Now, I know most of you are familiar with our US Constitution and other laws that bind, but the US is also bound by these international covenants. This right requires that governments ensure access to justice, truthful information about the violations and reparation. Our research also lays out that reparations recommendations can include a myriad of things. For instance, it can include restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, things like the truth and reconciliation that we saw in nations like South Africa. We also believe through our recommendations that Congress should pass legislation that would remove statutes of limitations related to the Tulsa massacre and its aftermath. Congress should form a commission to study the issue of reparations. And you'll hear more about that and what Congress can and is thinking about doing in the next segment of our program. What has to go hand in hand with reparative justice is systemic change. Systemic change is the only thing that's going to stop the disparities in policing and the other systems that lead to the kind of destruction and hatred that resulted in the Tulsa massacre. This has to include actions by several different actors, the local and state government, police departments, and the federal government. So for instance, local and state government should do things like fund, promote, and encourage local initiatives and enterprises 
that engage people who live in impoverished communities, like the community of North Tulsa, Oklahoma. Local governments should improve the quality of schools and healthcare systems in impoverished communities. We know from what we're seeing in this moment of COVID that the fact that so many communities do not have access to things like quality schools and quality healthcare are why we see the disparities that have emerged at this moment. And what should police departments do? Police departments should do things such as develop and implement plans with specific metrics to reduce racial disparities that are based on race, poverty, and geography. Local governments should stop depending on the police to be what they simply are not. Our police are not mental health counselors. They are not health experts. Instead, communities should be provided with the needed services and training for their police so that they can begin to use non-aggressive tactics. Any failure to do so only seeks to deepen the distrust in the community and frankly, leaves us with the kind of travesty that we are facing this week, the murder of yet another black man. And the federal government should start doing more to support states and local jurisdictions to help them promote and improve education, job training, mental health support and care and economic development for the low income communities that they have to serve. This is what our findings and our research show police and government can and should do. But as the fires continue to rage throughout America, many of you are asking, what can I do to address this crisis? What can I do about what's been laid bare with the killing of George Floyd? What can I do to make America hold true to its principles of equal justice for all? Now, whatever the answer is to those questions for you, I implore you to make certain that that answer includes reparations. Our nation cannot be made whole if we fail to reckon with our past and make amends for its travesties. Please continue to listen closely throughout the rest of our forum because you're going to hear more from national leaders now about how we can together and as an entire community help make Tulsa and the rest of America a whole nation and one that is true to its principles and values. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Nicole, uh, for all of your investment and work and what Human Rights Watch is helping us do here in Tulsa. And now I wanna turn uh, to another national leader uh, who is supporting Tulsa with his work as well, uh, Brian Stevenson, head of the Equal Justice Initiative. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Stevenson, and I'm speaking to you from Montgomery, Alabama. And I mostly wanna just thank all of the incredible uh, people in Tulsa doing extraordinary work to push that community and our nation to be more honest and confronting uh, the legacy of racial injustice. Uh, it's painfully clear uh, that we are still burdened with a history of racial injustice. And the legacy of that history continues to injure and kill and burden and menace and target communities of color. We've seen too many incidents in the last few weeks alone of black people being terrorized and threatened, killed, uh, menaced. And it has to end, but it can't end until we commit to this process that so many of you have dedicated yourselves to today. And I just want to speak to the importance and the urgency of that process. We are not free in America. We are burdened by a history of racial inequality, a narrative of racial differences, marginalized people of color, black people in particular, and until we confront that narrative, until we uh, tell the truth about this history, uh, we're not going to experience the kind of opportunities, the kind of freedom, the kind of justice uh, that we are entitled to. I think there's a smog across this land created by our long silence about this history of racial injustice. We are a post-genocide society. What we did to Native people when Europeans came to this continent was a genocide. We killed millions of Native people. We forced them from the Southeast to places like Oklahoma. 
Uh, we took their lands. Millions died. We didn't ever acknowledge the wrongfulness of that genocide. We instead created this narrative where we said that Native people are savages, and we used rhetoric like that to exclude them from the law and justice and the protection uh, that we uh, advocated so uh, strongly for in our Constitution. And that narrative of racial difference that allowed us to exclude uh, Native people from justice and fair treatment is the same narrative that we use to cultivate a nation that was utterly hostile to the rights and aspirations of Black people. Black people came to this continent as uh, crime victims, uh, kidnapped, enslaved. And the great evil of American slavery wasn't the, the involuntary servitude. That was horrific. It wasn't the forced labor. I believe the true evil of American slavery was this narrative we created to justify enslavement. Because people in Oklahoma, people in the American South didn't want to feel immoral as they enslaved black people. So they created this idea that black people aren't fully human, that black people aren't evolved, that black people don't have the needs that other people have, that black people can be brutalized, that black people can't do this and can't do that. And that narrative, that myth of white supremacy that was cultivated to justify enslavement has never really been acknowledged and it has never been addressed. We passed the 13th Amendment in 1865 to end involuntary servitude and forced labor, but we didn't acknowledge or talk about the ideology of white supremacy, which was the true evil of slavery. And because of that, I don't think slavery ended in 1865. It just evolved. It's the reason why thousands of black people were pulled out of their homes and terrorized and lynched and murdered and drowned and burned. It's the reason why the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, could not thrive without extraordinary resentment and bitter, bitterness. It is this myth, this ideology of white supremacy that took land from black people in Tulsa, that took the lives of, of so many uh, people who lived there, that continue to haunt and traumatize people in that community. And it's that myth that I believe we have to address. We've done a lot over the last hundred years. Our elders engage in this courageous civil rights movement. We've changed some laws We've ended some practices of Jim Crow, but this narrative, this ideology of white supremacy still persists, and it continues to haunt and menace us. That's the reason why young black people are being threatened on the streets. It's the reason why we have these horrific incidents of police violence. It's the reason why vigilantes think that they can hunt and menace black people. So it has to change, and that's why this conversation is so important. And what I'm urging is that we begin to reckon with the challenge that we face. Other countries have made progress. What we've seen in South Africa, what we've seen in Rwanda, what we've seen in Germany in response to human rights violations is part of what we need to see in America. And as this important conversation develops, I just have three thoughts I want to share. Number one is that to get to repair and remedy, we are going to have to first commit to truth telling. A physician cannot come up with an adequate treatment for a disease until the disease has been adequately diagnosed, until the symptoms and the character and the features of that disease have been well understood. Uh, when there's a storm and, and, and a few windows are blown out, uh, if we don't do a careful assessment about the other damage, we may miss flooding, we may miss structural problems, and that's what's going to be required as we engage in this work, I am persuaded that truth and reparation, truth and reconciliation, truth and restoration are urgently needed in our country. But I'm also persuaded that those things are sequential. You got to tell the truth before you get to rep reparations, before you get to restoration, before you get to reconciliation. And so truth telling is urgent. And that's why I'm proud of the work that's happening in Tulsa to elevate a consciousness about the history, not just what happened uh, in the 1920s, but also what happened uh, and continues to happen each day and each and each month. So I am very, very excited about the truth-telling work that's happening in Tulsa that needs to happen all over this country. The second thing is that we have to understand that remedy goes beyond uh, just stopping human rights violations. As a lawyer, when I got to law school, I was struck by how much attention is given to remedies. And, in the corporate context, you study remedies. In the tax context, you study remedies. Contract violations is all about remedies. Tort violations are all about remedies. Most of law school education is about how you remedy violations of the law. And it is never sufficient in most of these areas to simply have the wrongdoer doer commit 
to not doing wrong anymore. We don't accept that. In the criminal justice system, it's not sufficient if you rob someone to say, oh, I won't do that anymore. That's not an adequate remedy. And in these other areas, we have damages. We have actual damages and punitive damages and treble damages. We have a whole construct for thinking about what must be done to both remedy the problem, the violation, but to also disincentivize the behavior. It's that consciousness of remedies that we're trying to introduce into this work of racial justice. In the 1950s and 60s, we, uh, we eliminated many of the laws that had been so painful, uh, Jim Crow laws, so many of the restrictions. We passed federal laws to, to create protections for people, but we've never really talked about remedies and the absence of conversation about remedies is part of what I think we have to have. You know, we could have said in the 1960s to those states that denied black people the right to vote uh, for generations that you're now required to register every African-American to vote. I actually don't think that's a crazy idea. I don't know why black people have to register to vote in places where for so long they were illegally denied that opportunity. I don't know why we didn't say after denying admission to public universities to African-Americans for decades, uh, we're going to now make it possible for African-Americans who are qualified in these states to have free admission to those spaces. And it's not just to benefit African-Americans, it's also to reconcile ourselves to this damage. I actually think that truth and repair work, truth and justice work is for everybody. When I make a mistake, when I hurt somebody, when I do something, when I say something I shouldn't say, I want to apologize. I want to make re amends for that. I want to restore healthy relationship, not just because I feel bad about that and I want the person to recover, but it's also because I want to recover. And that consciousness is hopefully what we can share with this nation. Our nation is not well. Our nation has been corrupted by so much bigotry and bias. We see it every week. And to get well, we are going to have to understand that repair and remedy means honest reckoning with the past. And that's part of what's at play here. And finally, uh, we have to be uh, much more active and confronting the sources of injury. We are still living in spaces where we are targeted, where we are menaced, where we are humiliated. Uh, the Confederate iconography that litters the landscape in the region where I live is part of the problem that has to be confronted, which is why we're trying to create a new landscape, a new iconography that is healthy, that is whole, uh, that is healing. And it is healing that is at the heart of what we are talking about. I am someone who believes in the power of love and the power of redemption. Uh, I grew up in a faith community. In our community, if you fell down, somebody was there to encourage you to get back up. We are not defined by our sins. We are not defined by our worst mistakes. We are not defined by enslavement and lynching and segregation, but we will continue to be defined by those things if we are unwilling to repent, to engage in the process of redemption. I'm looking for that day. The beautiful thing I get to uh, to kind of rely on working here in Montgomery, Alabama, is that I stand on the shoulders of people who did so much more with so much less. This is a community rich with a history of activism, of courage, of hope, of fearlessness. And we're going to need that sense of activism. We're going to need that courage, that hope, that fearlessness uh, to advance the work that must be done. People in this community uh, would uh, put on their Sunday best and go places where they knew they were going to get brutalized and bloody, but they went anyway because they had this conviction, this faith, this commitment. I hope we'll embrace that commitment, that faith, that dedication, and that we will find our voices to also sing what they sang, which is that we shall overcome. There's great work, important work, necessary work that sits in front of us. I'm grateful uh, to the leaders and organizers of this event in Tulsa, that that work is beginning in earnest, that that work is pulling together important voices, that that work will succeed. I, I believe that we shall overcome. And I believe that because I've been next to people who stood when they were told to sit down, who spoke when they were told to be quiet, who had the kind of hope that could not be extinguished by police bullets, by dogs, by massacre, by violence, by lynching, by enslavement. They had the kind of hope and spirit and power that continues to thrive. Let's embrace that hope. Let's find ways to advance this work. Let's continue the incredibly important work of truth and justice in this nation. Let's make Tulsa a model for every community in America that has been burdened and compromised by the legacy of racial injustice. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for the work that you do. 
and extend my heartfelt gratitude for each and every one of you and my commitment to do what I can to join you, to support you, and to advance this work. Thank you all. Thank you, Brian. And uh, this really is a, a, a work of hope. Uh, and we have tremendous hope here in Tulsa. Uh, but when you think about uh, the really the great sin uh, in this, this reparations battle uh, and the narrative uh, that DeMario Solomon Simmons was talking about earlier, it starts with us being able to tell our own stories, being able to honor the victims of the massacre in our own way. Uh, and so that's what we've done through the Tulsa uh, Remembrance Project and the building of the Black Wall Street uh, Memorial. And so all of those listening, I want you to go to blackwallstreetmemorial.com uh, and be a part of us helping build this memorial. Buy a brick for yourself, for your family, uh, for your business, uh, that your brick uh, is going to be one of the foundational bricks that helps us uh, build the memorial, uh, a memorial long overdue uh, to, to the victims of this massacre. Check out the video and visit blackwallstreetmemorial.com. Located on the grounds of historic Vernon AME Church, the Black Wall Street Memorial will be dedicated to the hundreds of African American victims of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. For decades, their lives erased from history. We don't have a lot of accomplishments. We can say, look, we did this one right. We, we don't have a lot of examples to point to. Help us honor the lives lost by purchasing one of 10,000 commemorative bricks that will surround the memorial engraved with your name, your business, or a quote to remember historic Greenwood. We're going to have some successes that we can say, Tulsa did this better, something that can be duplicated in other communities, and we can get further down the, down the road on this fight for justice. To purchase your commemorative brick or to learn more about the Memorial Project, visit blackwallstreetmemorial.com. I will never forget and that is true. And in addition to getting a brick for the Black Wall Street Memorial at Historic Vernon Emmy Church. Also would love for you to go to www.change.org forward slash Tulsa Reparations now and sign a petition demanding that the city uh, and state of Oklahoma, city of Tulsa and state of Oklahoma uh, give reparations and that the US Congress passes our bill that we have uh, in Congress to get reparations here in Tulsa 
Oklahoma for the worst race mask in American history. We have a mayor who has said that reparations would be divisive. He needs to know that we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people all across this city, state, and nation that want to have reparations given to those descendants and survivors of this terrible tragedy. This is not just a Tulsa problem or Oklahoma problem. This is an American problem uh, whereby we can go after the those who drop bombs from airplanes in 9-11. Uh, we can go after those who drop bombs, the Japanese in, in Pearl Harbor. Uh, but the first act of aerial terrorism in American history, not one person was charged with the crime. And we went to Afghanistan and we rebuilt Afghanistan after we destroyed them. We, we went and we killed Osama bin Laden and his sons. Um, but, and then after Pearl Harbor, we went to Japan and we dropped eight, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. But to this day, nothing has been done. In fact, what this city has done is they've named buildings and streets after those who white thugs who killed and murdered innocent people. And so we need to send a message to this city, to this state, that we are united for reparations and we will be giving this petition to them once we reach the number that we need, but we cannot do it without you. So please, ma'am, and please, sir, uh, please sign the petition and share it with all your friends. Reparations now. And I'm, now it's my great pleasure to turn it over to uh, my dear friend, uh, Jeff Robinson. Thank you, Reverend Turner. Uh, and I'm now going to go back to Nkichi Taifa. We heard from her at the beginning of this program, but we're going to hear from her now in a really different way. Nkichi Taifa with a recitation of If We Must Die by Claude McKay. If we must die. Let it not be like hogs hunted and pinned in an inglorious spot while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs making their mock at our cursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood will not be shed in vain. then even the monsters we define shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. Oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave, and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies but the open grave? Like men and women, we will face the murderers, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. This poem, published in 1919, was written as a response to mob attacks by white Americans upon Black communities during the Red Summer. And it's very, very apropos, very apropos yesterday with respect to Dolph Tulsa, and very, very apropos today. Thank you. Thank you, Nkichi. We have heard several times that reparations is not just an issue for the survivors of the Tulsa massacre, but it's a national issue across America. And HR 40, the bill in Congress that gives the hope for a program of reparations is where we want to take our, our, our attention to now. And I would like to start with Dr. Julianne Malvo, who is a political economist and the president emeritus of Vintage College for Women. Dr. Malvo has had the opportunity to work with and speak to a number of the survivors of the massacre. And Dr. Malvo, thank you for joining us uh, this evening, this afternoon. And I'm wondering if you could tell us from a political common economist perspective, um, some of the things that are behind HR 40 and the, the movement for reparations in America. Well, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. I wanna thank Ron Daniels and everybody who's been involved. 
I um, learned so much from the first part of this program. I thought I knew a lot about Greenwood, but I learned more and I really appreciate the survivors. I've never been to Tulsa, but this program has made me feel like I really need to come there. So I wanna thank everybody for that. HR 40 really talks about repair. And I think that we've forgotten what black people suffered. I think we've forgotten how much was lost, not only in Tulsa, we can go back, we can look at Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1898, where almost 600 Black people were killed. Uh, one of the anecdotal uh, studies said the river ran red. That was that much blood in the river. Wilmington, like Tulsa, was ignited by something called economic envy. Economic envy is, first you have to be thinkified, as Brian said, Brian Stevenson said, you have to be uh, projected as less than human. Once you're projected as less than human, then you don't have the same rights that others do. White superiority in its face means black inferiority. And basically that means that black people could not have something that white people do not have. So if you look at Tulsa in 1921, one of the governor's commissions who, um, he asked the commission to tell them why um, this uprising happened. I don't, if it was a riot, it was a white folks riot. Um, but to ask why it happened, and one of the newspapers, uh, one of the business newspapers, I'm looking for the name of it now, but the newspaper wrote, their answer was that too many N-words had too much money. So that was the root of it. Because Black people did have a lot. We had hospitals of our own. Segregation prevented us from going to libraries. Um, we, we had it going on. But let me go even further back in terms of lynching and economic violence. I call it economic violence because too often economic factors are at the root of what's going on. Tulsa, too many black folks had too much money. Let's look at uh, Ida B. Wells' uh, friend, Tommy Moss, who uh, started a grocery store called People's Grocery in Memphis, Tennessee. Now the problem with his grocery store was that a white man had a store pretty much on the same block. And the white man said, oh no, this inn cannot have a store that competes with me. So on a roost, just like the roost with um, Dick Rowland and Sheriff Payne, on a roost, two boys had a fight over some marbles. They bust into this store, the people's store, grocery, with guns. Well, naturally the brothers are gonna fight back. Nobody was killed, but the sheriff basically locked up three black men and then they were lynched. It was economic envy, nothing else. Then the white man got the black man's store for eight cents on the dollar. So again, this was just a fear of competition. And we see it in the resistance to affirmative action. We see it in the resistance to looking at the price that has been paid by black people. And the thingify thing is important because that's how you can kill a George Floyd, Floyd, Floyd rather. That's how you can kill Breonna Taylor. You just have to thingify someone, make them less than human. And it, when you make them less than human, hey, it's okay. Now the connection to all of this in HR 40 is the deleterious effect that lynching had on black economic development. If you see someone who has a store and is lynched because he has a store, are you gonna start a store? I don't think so. Uh, if you, you know, we, it was basically a deterrent, black men who had cars. Some were lynched just because they had a car. Black women who dress well were often just yanked off the street and forced to work for white women. It's nine o'clock. So we, what we need to know is that all of these acts of violence, and there are so many, basically is an economic deterrent. That's why reparations, we want Tulsa to have what they, what they do, do, but Black America is due because economic envy is at the root of inequality. Thank you. Dr. Malvo, thank you very much for those examples from history, um, because what we keep seeing is that it's repeating itself and the same kind of causes are resulting in the same kinds of incidents and people are reacting to those incidents sometimes like, oh my gosh, this is so horrible, when the truth is this is simply the same story being repeated over and over and over again. Thank you for your insights into that.
And I would now like to go to Cam Howard, who is a member of the National Coalition for Coalition for Reparations for African Americans and COBRA. He is also a commissioner of the National African American Reparations Commission. And Cam, could you talk to us about some of the history behind HR 40? People have heard us discuss this bill that's in Congress, but this isn't something that happened or started just yesterday, is it? Hey, good evening, Jeff. Uh, thank you. No, actually, it is not. Actually, HR 40 has been a bill that has been in Congress for about 30 years right now. Um, and to speak more to that, you know, the title of this gathering is Tulsa, the case for reparations in HR 40, appreciating everything that has been said thus far. I, as you asked, I want to really talk about HR 40. In 2017, Congressman John Conyers introduced a revised HR 40 reparations bill. From 1989, when he first introduced it up until the time it was revised, the only federal legislation in this country to redress the history of enslavement and Jim Crow segregation was being touted as a reparations study bill. However, in 2015, the National African American Reparations Commission, NARC, along with NCOBRA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, began a revision of this bill to change it from a study bill to a remedy bill. The following year, Congressman Conyers accepted NARC's revision and introduced a new bill at the start of the 115th Congress under the new title, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act. So what is new to the revised HR 40? First, in addition to assessing the racialized harms, crimes and atrocities, as well as the injuries resulting therefrom for the periods of enslavement and Jim Crow segregation, with the new bill, the commission is also charged to examine the post Jim Crow harms, such as redlining, mass incarceration, that includes the dumping of crack cocaine in inner city black communities across America, predatory lending and police terror, which we are experiencing today. Secondly, the commission is charged to actually develop remedies to address the injuries from those past and ongoing crimes against our humanity. Finally, in the current bill, the remedies must be in line with international norms of reparations. That is, they must meet the standards of full reparations, meaning they must, quote, wipe out all consequences, unquote, of the crimes. Like Ms. Nicole said earlier, these standards in po include policies and programs that one must cease the ongoing harms and put in place guarantees of non-repetition. For instance, what action must be put in place to halt the summary executions of black men and women black children, gra uh, black grandmothers and black grandfathers by the criminal Patty Patrol police forces in this country. Two, policies and, and programs that meet the international standard of restitution. How do you return the people back to where they would have been had they not been injured in the first place? How would uh, Tulsa look if it had not been a Tulsa massacre? What would black Tulsa and black America look like today if we had restitution? Policies that must determine the type and amounts of compensation. Yes, compensation is an international norm of reparations and is included in the, in the revised HR 40. The commission must craft policy that provides satisfaction. How do we get our dignity back as a people? We who are the creators of high science, civilization, and spiritually determined societies. Correct telling of the history in this country is a must. This retelling must be included in school curriculums across this country. And finally, policies to ensure rehabilitation for the physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual injuries that we suffer from immensely today and that COVID-19 has both highlighted and taken advantage of. In this end, we are beginning to develop science of transgenerational epigenetics that reveal how the historical trauma that our ancestors experienced had a direct and negative effect on their genes and how that injury is passed down generationally. Those genetic injuries have shown to produce weakened immune systems for us today and have led to the high development of chronic and debilitating diseases that we see rampant in our communities. Rehabil reparations in the form of rehabilitation must be mandatory. Again, these are the five components of full rep repair that are included in HR 40. As a teaching tool for the revised bill in COBRA and NARC, produced the HR 40 primer, Seize the Time. <laughs> in the primer, it delineates the rationale for revising HR 40, 
It lays out the new charges of the commission. It explains the standards and outcomes of full repair. And then it, dem and it demonstrates how NARC's 10-point reparations program meet those international standards and outcome of full reparations. And finally, it includes the full text of the HR 40 bill. You can download the HR 40 primer, Seize the Time, at NCOBRA's website, ncobraonline.org. On January 3rd, 2019, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee took over the leadership and earnest of HR 40 by introducing it at the start of the 116th Congress. Her leadership has been both bold and dynamic. Having quickly reached 50 co-sponsors in May in 2019, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee pushed for a full Judiciary Committee hearing on HR 40 that was held on Juneteenth, the symbolic Black Freedom Day. During the week leading up to the hearing and over the next following two months, Congressman Lee, uh, CBC Chair Congressman Karen Bass, and COBRA and NARC worked to get an additional 50 co-sponsors signed on to HR 40. Currently, we have 127 co-sponsors to the bill, more than twice as many than ever before. This is great. In fact, it is, in fa is even fantastic. However, we are still sh sh short of our goal of 150 co-sponsors that the Congresswoman would like to have on our march for a full House of, Repar House of Representatives vote. To assist us in getting those remaining co-sponsors, and COBRA has created the HR 40 interactive map, which you see on the screen. One needs only to go to our website to quickly assess the Congressional Office of Legislators in their districts and their states to prod them to co-sponsor HR 40. This is a tool that we must learn to use, and this is our historical task. Again, this is the historical task that is before us today. Finally, uh, we do not want to forget that we have a Senate companion bill to HR 40, S1083, introduced in April of last year by Senator Cory Booker. As such, this is the first time since the end of Reconstruction, over 140 years, has there been a possibility for both houses of Congress to debate the issue of redress with people of Africans in this country. Yes, we must seize this time. So let us now get these 150 co-sponsors in the House so we can move on to the Senate side of our work. We are winning and we will win. Reparations now, HR 40 now. Thank you, Chuck. Cam, thank you so much for the work that you have been doing and for uh, your work in, in informing HR 40 into a different animal than what it was and one that we are prepared to act on. I'd like to throw it now to Montega Simmons of the Movement for Black Lives Policy Table. And Montega, you and your organization, along with NARC, have been doing work to talk about reparations, to educate people about what is actually at stake. And I would love it if you could share some of that with us and with our audience. Hey, thank you, Jeff. I'm honored to join the panelists and others who joined the call tonight. The novel coronavirus pandemic has exposed the longstanding disparities in health conditions for Black folk in the United States. The National African American Reparations Commission and other champions of reparatory justice believe resources to eliminate health disparities must be a central component of the demand for reparations in African, to African Americans. Health disparities for African Americans have persisted from enslavement into the 21st century, where African Americans are 80% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes than whites, and the men are 30% and women are 60% more likely to have high blood pressure. Black women are twice as likely to die from breast cancer than white women, and black men have a 50% higher chance to die from heart failure than white men. Historically, poverty, housing discrimination, unemployment, food apartheid, mass incarceration are chronic conditions in our communities that make vulnerable populations susceptible to dangerously high risk for infection and deaths by viruses like COVID-19. African-American children suffer disproportionately. I'm sorry, African-American children suffer disproportionately from childhood asthma and higher rates of obesity. Some researchers have actually used the phrase weathering to describe the inordinate toll that everyday trauma and discrimination has taken on Black Americans' physical and mental well-being. And that includes the impact of the prejudice and inadequate treatment they face when encountering medical professionals. Health mitigation policies designated to protect the public are inadequate 
because in many instances, African-Americans work in jobs that prevent them from sheltering in place. They're overrepresented in areas now classified as essentials, like bus drivers, maintenance workers, food, dietary, housekeeping, hospital support, staff, and delivery people that require them to interact with customers and clientele, thus increasing the likelihood of direct exposure to the virus. And that includes impact of, I apologize, I'm reading, I lost my, lost my place. Okay. The fact that the nation's jails and prisons are overpopulated with black and brown men, women, and children due to the racist practices of the criminal punishment system increases the likelihood of spreading the coronavirus. And there is general agreement that when African-Americans show up in emergency rooms, even during the current pandemic, regardless of their symptoms, they're less likely to be treated um, and recommended for hospitalization. NARC's 10-point program directly addresses the pressing need for the appropriate remedies to eradicate the devastating health disparities that exist for the Black community. Under the demand labeled resources for the health, wellness, and healing of Black families, they explicitly state that we demand funds for the establishment of a regional system of Black controlled health and wellness centers, fully equipped with highly qualified personnel and the best 21st century facilities to offer culturally appropriate, holistic, preventative, mental health, and curative treatment services. Funds to strengthen existing hospitals and medical centers serving Black communities, i.e. Harlem Hospital, Howard University Medical Center, and the reopening of institutions that previously served Black communities that were shut down due to divestment and lack of funds. In addition, there's a demand for funds to strengthen institutions like Meharry Medical College and scholarships for students that are actually interested in attending these institutions who are committed to providing a period of service to the Black community. In addition, the Movement for Black Lives has actually issued demands representing a list of what Black people need in these times. It's a list of demands that are directed toward the state that represent an invitation to all Black people and other people who share our vision to join in the fight to assert our rights and protect our communities. The list is a continuation of the Vision for Black Lives platform and our vision for our community's health, justice, freedom, and power. These ideas are not new, but they are more urgent than they ever have been. Therefore, all these demands apply to all people, including our people who are undocumented, incarcerated, and otherwise marginalized or disabled. The first one being any response to this, to, be, to this disease must put people first. All relief efforts must prioritize Black families, communities, over corporations. The second one being to free them all. There must be a thorough plan to release people from jails, prisons, and detention centers. Number three is housing and healthcare for all. All barriers to housing, healthcare, and education must be removed. Four is free the vote. Every person should be able to vote. We must ensure that all people have access to the ballot and do not have to risk their health to vote. Number five is health care, not warfare. Emergency powers must not be abused. People's health and safety must be a priority. We believe you, me, we, that all Black lives are inherently valuable. Thank you. Montega, thank you so much for the work that you're doing and your efforts this evening. Um, I want to go now to Jaziri X, who is a member of the National African American Reparations Commission, an incredibly talented artist. And he has some words for us that are especially apropos this evening. Don't let them get away with murder. Don't let them get away with murder. Don't let them get away with murder. 
Thank you, Jaziri X. Uh, what an incredible presentation and how, how apropos for uh, the occasion. I'm Dr. Ron Daniels, president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century and convener of the National African American Reparations Commission, which is called NARC. On this solemn yet hopeful and inspirational occasion, it is my honor to introduce the woman who is leading the national effort to ensure the passage of HR 40 the bill that will establish a commission to study reparations proposals for African-Americans. I've had the privilege and honor of working with her on a range of issues over the years, from democracy and development in Haiti, to seeking to protect the rights of black Seminole freedmen and Cherokee freedmen in Oklahoma, to the struggle for reparations. When the Honorable John Conyers, the original architect of the and lead sponsor, departed Congress, there was deep concern in the reparations movement over who would take the mantle of leadership on HR 40. Those concerns have definitely been arrayed, allayed because the torch has been passed to an ardent freedom fighter, visionary and courageous legislator and vigorous champion of HR 40. It is my honor to introduce the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee from Houston, Texas. Dr. Daniels, thank you so very much for your very kind introduction, but more importantly, the strength of your actions, uh, the continued um, activities that you have done in the midst of a storm, uh, and your persistence for a victory. Good evening to everyone. I am delighted, saddened but delighted, to be able to join you for the Tulsa Massacre and the destruction of Black Wall Street the case of reparations and H.R. 40. It is 
a moment in history that none of us would have expected, would have coincided with our efforts to honor those uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who are the descendants of the horrific and violent and vile Tulsa race massacre. I wanna take a moment to just refresh our memories. According to a Red Cross estimate, 1,256 houses were burned, 215 others were looted but not torched, two newspapers, a school, a library, a hospital, churches, hotels, stores, and many other Black-owned businesses were among the buildings destroyed or damaged. It is appropriate that we honor you today, 99 years, but yet continue to have this burned in our hearts that a young boy, a young black boy on an elevator had to be used and victimized and lied on. And now the story continues. And so it is certainly appropriate to acknowledge Dr. Tiffany Crutcher. And I offer condolences and recognition to her family for the loss and the pain and suffering over the loss of their beloved Terrence Crutcher at the hands of a police officer and their commitment to struggle for police reform and accountability in Tulsa and the nation. Certainly I acknowledge my own constituent and his family, George Floyd, and of course in the last couple of weeks, Ahmaud Arbery, and of course, Ms. Taylor in Louisville, Kentucky. How many others from Eric Garner to Trayvon Martin to Walter Scott and so many others. And then of course, the inadequacies that we face in education and healthcare, the environment, criminal justice reform. I cannot thank again, Dr. Ron Daniels enough as a convener of NARC. I thank him for his leadership. Again, he is deserving of that. I'm so grateful to have known and been a friend and a sister to the Honorable Dean, late Dean of the United States House of Representatives, John Conyers. We worked together on police brutality, criminal justice reform, prison reform, and he was at the forefront of civil rights, civil justice, and all things good to free our people. Thank you to Jeffrey Robinson. He has taken this to his deeply embedded heart. Thank you to the ACLU for becoming our very strong and vigorous partner, unyielding, unending, and watching, waiting, working for the victory to come. Thank you to a friend, Nicole Austin Hillary of the Human Rights Watch. We've worked together on many, many issues. And certainly I commend all of the sponsors, the national sponsors, local leaders in Tulsa uh, who organized this commemoration, uh, this painful moment, but yet a commitment uh, that we will see this vindicated as we continue to fight for reparations. Let me commend all of the local leaders for staying the course and providing such a provocative and important introduction into Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, and as well reminding us, as was said by our good friend, and as I had intended to say myself, Brian Stevenson reminded us of the truth. My task is to offer uh, an important call to action. It is to reflect on the pain of Wall Street. And as I started giving at least minimally uh, the destruction, the vicious destruction. I didn't add that the National Guard tried to get there and declared martial law, but by the time they'd gotten there to put out the fires, uh, by June 2nd, some 6,000 were under armed guard at the local fairgrounds. This race massacre is one crying out for relief. It is crying out for reparations in a more extended manner. Isn't it tragic? that we today in 2020 are facing the same kind of onslaught. We are all reminded of Emmett Till that followed some years later and the mutilated body that his mother allowed us to see. Oh God, we thought that in that moment, in the moment of Dr. Martin Luther King, the civil rights movement, the black power movement, that in 2020 we'd be facing a new horizon. But that is the reason I believe that the call for H.R. 40, the Commission to Study Reparations and Proposals, is long overdue. 
citing Dr. King again, if not now, then when? We combine that in the crisis we face today with the massive protests across the nation, with the idea of the vicious and, and vile virus of COVID-19. No, we did not really know and understand that virus, but we did know that we had a commander in chief. We know that the task as a member of the Homeland Security Committee of the commander in chief is to take charge at the moment the nation is in trouble to guide the agencies that are responsible to help the nation get out of trouble. What does that mean? As a senior member of the Homeland Security Committee admits the test kits should have been prepared in January. Social distancing should have been ordered. Stay at home orders should have been ordered and face masks. None of that occurred. So our good friends in New York, for example, many of them found themselves running to emergency rooms where they were given an aspirin and told to go home where they could not get tested, where they went home and infected their family members, and then the large toll. Disparate impact on African Americans began to rage across the nation, and COVID-19 took its place as a disaster that we had never seen. High numbers of deaths in New Orleans after Mardi Gras, high numbers of deaths in Chicago, moving on to different pockets, hitting Atlanta, coming into Houston, the state of Texas, being on the list as the state with the fourth largest number of COVID-19. Losing our loved ones, losing pastors as I did today, losing people that you thought were in the best of health, young people being impacted, senior citizens being impacted, now children being impacted, and test kits just coming in a widespread manner. Disparate treatment, disparate access to health care questions about why this particular virus became a plague in the African-American community. No, I don't hold to the point of underlying conditions. Those have been part of the African-American community tragically uh, since our time of slavery, when we were obviously treated inequitably and brutally for 400 years. It should not have been, but these Items are converging. This idea of COVID virus to highlight the massive inadequacies of what we have in this particular nation dealing with the African American community. We in the Congressional Black Caucus saw those inequities. As we are being told, a large share of African American businesses may never open after COVID 19. That should not be. We're knowing that many of our historically black colleges are facing challenging times. We're continuing with mass incarceration. And when we tried to fight for the very law that was passed by the United States Congress with the efforts of those of us on judiciary of compassionate release of all of these people that had been in prison for year after year because of mandatory minimum, the DOJ under the present administration decided to rewrite the rules. But we are fighting to ensure that individuals who are deserving of compassionate release, we're fighting to make sure that detention centers uh, where people of color are housed are not petri dishes for the COVID-19. All of that speaks to the larger understanding of reparations that deals with the African-American people. Let me for a moment give you just a brief economic history that many of you know. We know the brutality of slavery. We know the separation of families, the taking away of babies as mothers were giving birth. Uh, we know families were being separated, as I said. We know that the brutality of the master uh, was without question. We were property. We know that in the Constitution, we were not a whole person. But did we also continue to recognize that we built the economic engine of this nation? The economic engine was not in the Northeast or the Northeast corridor. It was in the Deep South, where it was landed and people grew cotton. Cotton became king, a terminology that many people use without knowing but it built this nation's economic foundation. It actually built New York's Wall Street and New York's banks because that was the commodity that turned into cash. It became the greatest export that we had to Europe, cotton. And the only way that cotton could be financially successful is on the backs of those who never received salary, never received workman's compensation, health insurance, life insurance, retirement, never received their place in the sun. 
And so as we moved into reconstruction, we thought there was a glimmer of hope that was immediately dashed by the Southern Compromise. And back we were into Jim Crowism and the hanging fruit. Never a moment when we could have received that 40 acres and a mule. And when I speak to children, I tell them that, no, that is not a humorous phrase. It is actually, as General Sherman had perceived it, you get your house or your acreage and your mule. And just lo and behold, if we had formed a joint venture, 10 of us had 400 acres and a couple of mules, and we could have established Ford Motor Company, or we could have established Kellogg, or we could have established Microsoft. None of that was given to us. And we had to simply be part of the violence. That was our legacy. So what is this HR 40? It is legislation, and I do thank my good friend uh, who has been so diligent on this legislation and has worked so hard, Cam Howard, thank you so very much. It is what we should be doing now. It is, as I have indicated, it's time is now. The convergence of COVID-19, uh, the glaring inadequacies of healthcare among African-Americans, the lack of wealth, uh, the redlining that occurred, uh, the fact that we are suffering more than any other community with the loss of businesses by COVID-19, the fact that we've passed a HEROES bill, three trillion plus, but we are having great difficulty in getting that bill passed in order to be at least a stopgap for many of our African-American businesses and others, recognizing that we need that cash disbursement. Listen to what is in that bill. Does that not sound like proposals as it relates to the overall systemic question of racism uh, in, that is being addressed in HR 40. What is it? It is a commission of individuals, of well-informed individuals that will look at the systemic treatment of African-Americans through the moments of slavery to this point of 2020. It will do nothing out of the ordinary. It will do something that we've already done. Have many of you heard of the $10 million settlement including lifelong medical treatment was provided to victims uh, and the control group and heirs of the Tuskegee syphilis study advocated for by the few members of Congress that happened to be of color in 1974. Uh, you know that where 399 black men and over a 40 year period were left untreated to study the disease. Are you not familiar with 177 black victims of North Carolina's forced sterilization program that received $10 million? Or in 1994, the Florida legislature paid 150000 to each of the 11 survivors who were forced to flee in 1923, Rosewood. And then, of course, Chicago 2015 passed a reparations ordinance. And then our own uh, Evanston, Illinois, and our council member there who passed a recent reparations legislation and our college students that are here in Washington, D.C., who were brilliant enough to try and help uh, those who were descendants of the slaves who were sold to keep the university open. Why are we shrink shrinking uh, from the understanding that this is not unusual, out of the ordinary, an aberration? In fact, it is now. It is what we need to do now. And so HR 40 creates this commission. It establishes an apology, which many of you are already aware of. As it establishes an apology, then it begins to go to work. And that work is a recognition that there is a continuing injury. Can anyone in 2020 deny that there is not a continuing in, uh, injury when the predominant population of the nation's jails, local, state, and federal, are people of color and African-American young men? When we are 13 to 14 percent of the population and we are the majority of those who are victims of police killings, and when we see one of the most unspeakable crimes that mankind has ever seen, and womankind, and that is the killing of George Floyd. Just take a moment to count nine minutes. Just take a moment to fold your hands behind your back, lay on your stomach, and to cry out, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Mama, mama, mama. If you can imagine any of that, then you can imagine the continuing in injury. And you can likewise 
continue to understand the legitimacy of the very essence of what we are trying to do. And that is the commitment to redress the federal government which sanctioned the enslavement and subsequent discrimination and the actual compensation in whatever form it might take. Just a moment as I bring us to a close, just a moment on this idea that cotton was king and we built this nation. Just a moment to answer those who say that I did not have slaves. This is 2020. Well, I joined with the scholars who've indicated you benefited from slavery. And in fact, the federal government that is yours sanctioned this through its laws, continued to have a constitution who ensured that we were two thirds of a person not until the 1860s was the 13th Amendment passed. And even after that de facto segregation and the viciousness of what I said to you earlier of Jim Crowism uh, and the divide, even to the extent that soldiers in World War II that were African-American were treated worse than the German prisoners. So there is all of those elements that we should in fact take heed to. I am asking each and every one of you, as has been already indicated, we can get up to 150 in this moment in history. Let us seize this time. We can get up to 200. Why? Because people are seeing the glaring inadequacies. No one, no one can grapple with and understand what happened to George Floyd. Nor can they understand Ahmaud Arbery, all the others, or Breonna Taylor, all innocent in the terms of following what should be protect and serve. If there is no reason and time then now to be able to follow the pathway of those who would want to do right, just as we're getting ready to introduce uh, police accountability legislation, we can also provide uh, the pathway for those who believe that something else should be done. Uh, and what should be done uh, should be the allowing of, if you will, uh, the allowing of um, a important step forward, and that would be uh, this legislation, H.R. 40. So I'm delighted to have heard all of you. Um, I am delighted to uh, be able to know that uh, there are people, though they are pained, uh, though they are feeling pain, as those who are descendants of this Tulsa race massacre, they are ready to act. And that is what I'm calling upon all of my people, my brothers and sisters, the human family, uh, to be able to act and to be able to understand those words that I gave to you and which was, if not now, then when. I do want to close again, as I said, uh, with these words from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King that are so potent, it is unbelievable uh, that these words uh, were said some many years ago. Uh, and those words are enormously interesting uh, and, and vital. He spoke about riots. Um, and I don't like to use that terminology, if you don't mind. I prefer using the term protesters uh, and, of course, uh, seeking to encourage them not to be violent. Uh, and whoever might want to intrude into that, uh, we ask them not to be violent. Uh, but what he said was that these riots represent the pain of people, the enormous pain that people are experiencing. And those riots uh, are, uh, in fact, an expression of people who do not have a voice. And they reflect more, he said, of the inadequacies of their life the fact that they don't have food to eat, they don't have adequate housing, they don't have an ability to get good health care. All of that is a reflection of their protests. So don't condemn them, understand them, and be able to speak for them. Their voices are not heard. And since their voices are not heard, we must speak for them. The millions, thousands that are on the nation's streets as we speak, feel that they are voiceless and unheard. Reparations is a call and an answer to that pain and the silence that people believe they are suffering under. 
So we need sponsors, co-sponsors of this legislation, but we need action. We intend to have a hearing on June 19th. Uh, we will look to other opportunities as well, as I've been speaking to Dr. Daniels, and we look to mark this bill up, pass it on the floor of the House, and yes, we want the President of the United States to sign this legislation because we cannot go without this commission, this work, this answer, this solution, this resolution, this powerful response. We cannot go any longer without a victory for our people and for this nation. Thank you all so very much for this powerful and dynamic session. Thank you for bringing to life the Tulsa race riot. And thank you for understanding that the case for reparations is now. And it is now, it is forever, and we will have the victory. Not to sing the song, we shall overcome, but to sing the song, we have, we have overcome. God bless all of you. God bless the work that you're engaging in. God bless our ancestors and God bless the United States of America. Well, we certainly uh, now understand why um, I characterize our esteemed Congresswoman as uh, a visionary and courageous leader on this legislation. Uh, we are blessed to have Sheila Jackson Lee uh, be at the forefront of this effort. Uh, so we thank her so much. Uh, let me conclude the call by saying their blood cries out. Their blood cries out is an appropriate frame for the call that the Congresswoman just issued. First and foremost, I would like to again commend Dr. Tiffany Crutcher and Reverend uh, Robert Turner and Re Representative Regina Goodwin and all of our sisters and brothers from the host committee in Tulsa who have never, never given up the struggle to achieve reparatory justice for the massacre and the destruction of Black Wall Street that took place 99 years ago today. I, I gotta say, I am so moved and frankly, I feel ashamed that I have not done more. We salute you for your vigilance and your dedication to a righteous cause. Unfortunately, as the Congresswoman outlined and everybody has spoken to today, the terror continues. With the onslaught of the coronavirus pandemic, which is disproportionately infecting and killing black people because of persistent health and economic disparities and inequalities, and the killing of black people continues unabated with the economic violence. Let me say again, the economic violence of chronic unemployment, underemployment, joblessness, predatory lending, rampant redlining, gentrification is encroaching on the Greenwood District even as we speak, and the underdevelopment of marginalized black communities across this nation. But true crust the earth will rise again. In memory of our ancestors, this moment cries out for transformative stru structural change to cleanse the virus of white supremacy and structural and institutional racism from the systems of racialized capitalism in this nation. It's time to rise up and demand reparation now by advancing HR 40. According to the National African Refer Reparations Commission, the National African American Reparations Commission or NARC uh, will convene on June 19th in conjunction with the hearing that will be held that Congresswoman has just talked about. We hope that hearing will take place uh, last year, um, uh, on Juneteenth, we had the congressional hearing followed by a ACLU NARC sponsored event at the historic Metropolitan AME Church. And so we will be convening on Juneteenth, uh, Juneteenth a forum entitled COVID-19 and the Killing of Black People, Advancing the Demand for Reparations in HR 40. We want, we must build on the, irres, build an irresistible tide to achieve reparations now. Therefore, we encourage the audience, audience to visit the website ibw21.org, that's www.ibw21.org, to enrich your knowledge about reparations by learning about NARC's 10 point program, reparations program, and the HR 40 primer that was developed by in Croba, which Cam Howard re referenced earlier. We encourage you to use today's historic 
powerful forum and the forthcoming Juneteenth National Town Hall meeting to convene local virtual or live town hall meetings to build, uh, to build momentum for reparations now. You can organize your own events and we're, and we're prepared to help you do that. We must build momentum for reparations now. So that the words reverberate from this space across the nation and the world. Their blood cries out, advance HR 40, hashtag reparations now, aluta continua, aluta continua. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. And to end our program, I'm hoping that Christy Williams will come back and give us a perspective from our local partners in Tulsa. That would be the city councilor, Vanessa Hall Harper. I am very sorry. My screen went out, but you are right. And uh, Councilor, Councilwoman Hall Harper, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, as we near the closing of this presentation, I want to share these words. In the children's book, Alice in Wonderland, Alice and the Cheshire Cat had a conversation. Alice asked the cat, which road should I take? The cat replied, where do you wanna go? Alice said, I don't know. Then the cat said, then it doesn't matter. We have just discussed the beginnings of a plan. So we will know which road to take. As we close our time together tonight, many of us may be thinking and wondering where is their hope? In light of the horror of the past few weeks and the history you have heard tonight, where can we look for hope that true change will come? I want to share with you a few thoughts from Robert Unger and Dr. Cornell West. Change requires nothing, excuse me, change requires neither saintliness nor genius. What it does require is a conviction that life is of incomparable value. Nothing should matter more to us than the attempt to grasp our life while we have it and to awaken from the slumber of routine, of compromise and prostration so that we may die only once. Hope is not the condition or cause of action. Hope is the consequence of action. And those who fail in hope should act practically or conceptually so that they may hope. We and you are hope. So please, won't you act now by signing the petition, investing in the Black Wall Street Power Group, purchasing bricks for the Black Wall Street Memorial and supporting HR 40. These are the keys to building competitive economic communities as Dr. Claude Anderson has taught us from his book, Power Nomics. Reparations, then what? We have to build a national reparations plan and practice group economics if we are to create an economy within an economy. It can be done. Our ancestors of Greenwood already did it and left us the blueprint. The challenge to all of us is to create hope by our actions. If you feel your hope lagging and you start to look for a savior, look in the mirror first. We thank you for tuning in and we will be out there creating hope and change. Will you please come and join us? We will now close this evening with words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Good night, stay safe and God bless. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Hall Harper. And thank you everyone for the efforts in putting on this fantastic presentation this evening.
on April 3rd, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, Dr. King gave a speech, the last speech of his life. And as he was talking to the audience, he was describing an incident where he had been stabbed earlier in his life, stabbed with a letter opener, and the letter opener had come to within an inch of his aorta. And the surgeons told him that if he had sneezed, he would have died. And he was telling the audience about a little nine-year-old white girl who had written him a letter saying, I'm happy you didn't sneeze. And as the audience laughed, he followed up on that thought. And I want to leave you with this thought tonight. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch house. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream, taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962 when Negroes in all Bennett, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963. Black people of Birmingham, Alabama, aroused the conscience of this nation, brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. They... So he didn't sneeze. And what you see on the screen now are steps you can take to act right now. View and sign the petition for reparations from the city of Tulsa and the state of Oklahoma to make full reparations for the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. And act now to contact your representative in Congress to ask them to support HR 40. If you go to this site, https colon backslash backslash or forward slash forward slash action dot aclu dot org the slash send message if you go there you will get connected to a form that will allow you to contact your congressperson and ask them to support hr 40. thank you so much for your time this evening and we hope to see you in the fight for racial justice in America. Good night.